for a moment uh, and go off into cloud computing uh, for a moment because v6 is important and clouds are important in the future of the internet. As you know, uh, Google and others like uh, Microsoft and Amazon uh, and IBM and so on are uh, using cloud-based computing systems in order to deliver, uh, deliver uh, computational services remotely. Uh, my friends don't like it when I say this is more or less like time sharing on steroids. And the reason they don't like that expression is that it doesn't really cover all the kinds of functionality that you can do in the cloud. But it gets the sense uh, across that this is a, uh, a re revisiting of the way in which you deliver computing cycles, uh, memory, and processing uh, to uh, people who are remote from the data center. The reason that I put this up, however, is that we are at the stage now in cloud computing where internet was in 1973. In 1973, there were networks. IBM had SNA, Digital had DECAD, uh, Hewlett Packard had DS. So you could network computers together, but usually only ones from the same proprietary vendor. We couldn't get the IBM machines to talk to the DEC machines or talk to the uh, HP machines, except by building very complicated boxes that knew how to translate back and forth between the two. Um, and eventually, uh, the consuming public, or at least the business side of the public, uh, said, to the makers of those networks, we really want to have a non-proprietary standard so that all kinds of machines can talk to each other. Bob Kahn and I did our work on the basis of that same need in the U.S. Defense Department. We needed to make sure that we were not trapped into having to use only one vendor's computing system in order to achieve networking. And so the internet design was deliberately non-proprietary. It was deliberately not patented. Uh, it was, in fact, released uh, globally without any constraint in the middle of the Cold War. And uh, looking back, I wondered how in the hell we got away with uh, releasing all this information uh, without any constraint. And I think the answer was nobody noticed. <laughs> and was, you know, we were flying under the radar. Uh, but the point I want to make here is that at some point, we are going to have to graduate from using cloud computing resources, client to server, laptop to cloud, to causing information to flow back and forth between the clouds. Google has a data liberation policy which basically says anything you put in, you should be able to get out and move it elsewhere. Uh, however, if it turns out that you have a lot of data, pulling it into your laptop may turn out not to be very feasible. <coughs> Ultimately, if you wanted to move the data from one cloud to another, you really want the two clouds to cooperate. But in order for that to happen, there have to be standards for the ways in which clouds will exchange information. The clouds won't even be able to talk to each other if they don't have IP address space through which to do that talking. You need more than IPv6 to do it. Clearly, you need more standards of more layers in order to achieve this effect. And it gets more complicated after that. There are possibilities of getting computations to happen simultaneously in two clouds where they're exchanging data during that computation, not simply moving data from one place to another. There are lots of other possibilities. The reason I stress this to you is that there are huge opportunities for innovation. There are big opportunities for people anywhere, including here, to explore what the standards should be, what the application should be, what, in what ways can we make use of multiple clouds uh, in order to improve our computing environment and resilience and ability to preserve information. There are also some other hairy problems associated with the growth of the internet and dependence on the World Wide Web, intellectual property being one example. Most intellectual property laws, copyright laws in particular, are related to preventing people from copying things without permission. If you look at the way the World Wide Web works, the first thing a browser does is go and copy a home file from somebody else's computer and then interpret it for you. So it's a giant copying <coughs> agent. These two are in conflict with each other. And ultimately, I think we have to come up with alternative ways of rewarding people who produce intellectual property that doesn't necessarily rely on preventing people from copying things because it's too easy to do. I'm going to skip over the semantic web. Tim berners lee is working very hard in the World Wide Web Consortium on raising the, the floor of the semantic um, uh, expression in the internet. Today, most of what we do at Google, for example, tends to be syntactic in nature. You search for web pages that have these words on them. It would be better if we could search for web pages that have words that mean X because you know, there are different ways of expressing X. So a semantic network would be a lot more effective. But I wanted to focus on one other thing here, which again emphasizes the importance of um, innovation in thinking about uh, the internet and its use. 
uh, as we use applications to build uh, spreadsheets, to build uh, documents, uh, to build other kinds of uh, complex databases, we are building very, very complicated data structures. Those data structures are of no use unless there's application software that knows how to interpret them. Over time, it may turn out to be hard to make sure that the software that can interpret those data structures is actually available and functioning. I'm fairly confident that we can move from one physical medium to another. We can not get <laughs> from one kind of storage uh, system to another. But making sure that there is software that knows what those bits mean is a non-trivial exercise. When a company says, I'm not going to support this particular application anymore, uh, I have newer versions of it, uh, maybe they're not backward compatible, but for business reasons I can't support the older thing. If you don't have access to those older uh, versions of the software, or if there isn't any natural migration path from the old representation to something new, uh, maybe the new software just doesn't know how to deal with the older formats, then the information that was important to you is suddenly not available and you have a bag of rotten bits. And I'm thinking here not next year, not five years, not ten years, but a hundred years from now, or a thousand years from now. We don't have the equivalent of digital vellum. Vellum has lasted for a very long time, but we don't have the same experience with digital formats. So preserving our ability to interpret this is really important. Hard problem, something that some of you might in fact want to tackle. So let me try to summarize all this. You know, what does all this harangue uh, mean? Let me start out by saying that uh, the innovation environment of the internet has been vastly facilitated by open access to the network itself. Anyone can build a piece of the net is free to connect it to the rest of the network as long as you found someone who is willing to cooperate with you. In fact, our model, when Bob and I was, uh, were writing the original design, is that anyone should be able to build a piece of the internet and then connect it to the rest of the world. Business, business models, uh, uh, of course, uh, having to be satisfied. The other thing which has been very clear is that open source practices have been also very facilitating because they let people take advantage of other people's ideas, learn from them, and expand and, and grow and evolve. Uh, if you look at the internet protocol stack, it's available to you. You can get at it in, in all the various layers, including the most uh, fundamental one, the IT layer. Well, you can build new protocols on top of IT. That's what the Internet Engineering Task Force has been doing for years. So when you have new applications, you're free to try those things out. That openness has been at the heart of the innovation and business engine that the internet has driven. Uh, here's an example. The, the term webmaster didn't even exist until the guys at Netscape Communications released their uh, uh, Netscape uh, browser and, uh, and server. Uh, the, uh, this, they call it Netscape Mosaic. Um, what was interesting about the browsers is that they all had the property that you could ask to see the source code that produced the web page that you were looking at. The consequence of that ability to see that source code is that a lot of webmasters were self-taught. They simply looked to see what the source code looked like and they tried it out and made changes and experimented. This openness, this open access to the substance of the World Wide Web uh, was a real innovator and created a set of jobs that hadn't existed before in the form of webmasters. Uh, there's another example, but a more general one, uh, and this gets to the heart of the question, how do we turn London <coughs> into Silicon Valley? Uh, this question was asked by former Prime Minister Tony Blair uh, in a visit that he made to the Silicon Valley years ago. I happened to be among the 10 or so people from the Silicon Valley who sat around the table at lunch. Uh, and uh, the Prime Minister talked about education and how important that was for increasing uh, high-tech opportunities in the UK. But then he sort of ended uh, this discussion by asking the question, how do I turn London into Silicon Valley? And there was dead silence uh, around the table. And this was kind of embarrassing because, you know, when the Prime Minister asked a question, you're supposed to <laughs> so I, I, I said, well, look, why don't we go around the table and, uh, and say what it is about the Silicon Valley that enabled the, Steve Jobs was there, uh, the fellow who ran AMD and so on, uh, John Chambers uh, from Cisco. So I said, what was it about the Silicon Valley environment that helped you be successful? So Steve raises his hand and he says, well, one thing we all have in common is we've all failed at one time or another. <laughs> and it didn't put the mark of Cain on our foreheads. Uh, and this is actually quite important because in the Silicon Valley, failure does not necessarily mark you forever as a bad person. It 
it's a mark of experience. Now, if you fail all the time, that's a story. <laughs> but but if, if a single failure or two, and I think Steve is probably thinking about his next uh, initiative, which eventually was acquired by Apple, and uh, Steve came back, and of course Apple has been incredibly successful. So his point was that failure did not mark you forever. And in Europe, that's generally not the case. Failure, a business failure is quite severe in terms of business reputation. I understand it. Um, there's also a certain amount of tolerance uh, for risk and failure in the Silicon Valley. Uh, we accept the idea that some uh, enterprises won't work, won't succeed. The venture capital community accepts that. They're willing to take risks, they're willing to put money into businesses that may not succeed. Uh, but this risk taking attitude is not uniformly felt in Europe, or perhaps not uniformly found here, either in the UK or in London. Uh, so that's another element. It's a condition in the Silicon Valley that's important. The third thing that's very important is simply having access to well-trained people, engineers, financial people, business people, and so on. That ensemble has to be readily available to you in order to assemble a business. It doesn't hurt that the Silicon Valley is a small place. Most of us know each other, we've worked for each other, and we've been in businesses together, we've competed with each other. The ease with which you can draw upon that talent pool to assemble new companies is actually quite stunning. And uh, it's not the same as the Japanese kairetsu, which is a more, not less personal and more business uh, structure. But the idea here is that it's not very hard to form a new business. Uh, so you have to have access to venture capital, but that's not enough. You also have to have a, a vibrant stock market because you need ultimately to get to IPO in order to have enough capital to grow the business. If you can't get there, if you don't have access to a good stock market, then you will have stunted growth or the inability to get past uh, some of the initial funding. So uh, these are all elements that have to obtain in order to turn any place into a Silicon Valley-like uh, enterprise. And so one of the tasks that we have uh, collectively is to figure out what's missing, if anything, in, uh, here in the UK that needs to be supplied in order to get this kind of invention to work. Uh, I just want to emphasize again that IPv6, implementing IPv6 will not cause London to turn into Silicon Valley. This is not pixie dust. On the other hand, it's an important element because in its absence, this internet engine won't be able to grow. And if it can't grow, then it can't become the substrate on which these new businesses get started. Uh, I noted that um, uh, David Young uh, had a, an editorial uh, in the Telegraph this morning. He talked about uh, employer laws that are intended to protect employees and said that there might be some unintended consequences of that protection. Uh, it caused employers to hesitate to hire people because of the obligations they might undertake. Now, I'm no expert uh, in, uh, in your legal system at all, but I would say that it's that kind of side effect that needs to be examined with some care to figure out what steps can be taken to give more latitude to an employer to accept the risk of hiring an employee and growing a business. This is the same sort of risk-taking thing that has made the Silicon Valley uh, a successful place. So finally, let me just point out in terms of opportunities that the internet is not hardware, it's software. It's an architecture. It's a structure of standards. And it is truly an endless frontier because anything you can figure out how to program, you're free to try out. And so when you're looking for uh, innovation in the software domain, this is the place to be. If the internet stays fully connected, if all of the world can get on, your software can reach every single human being and every single device on the network, creating a substrate on top of which new businesses can be built. Well, I'll stop there. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the, uh, today's discussion. Thank you. Thanks very much, Vin. And we'll have questions and answers in the panel session towards the end of this afternoon. I know you've got some burning questions to fire into.